Uh, good evening. It's uh, the six o'clock hour uh, this Monday, November the 7th, uh, 2011. And we're going to call the uh, regular city council uh, meeting uh, to order at this time. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Council Member Ania. Here. Council Member Murray. Here. Council Member Shalong. Here. Council Member Westfall. Here. And Mayor Schlert. I'm here. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Westfall, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody that's here tonight as we're all trying to get uh, adjusted to uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, also, I'd like to welcome those that are participating via live streaming on the computer. Uh, Mr. Black, do you have anything to report out of closed session regarding action? Mayor, no final actions were taken in closed session. Very good, thank you. So, moving along at this time, uh, uh, we will move to <coughs> acknowledgments, and uh, we have uh, two important ones uh, today. And uh, the first one up, I've asked uh, Council Member uh, Shalong to uh, make that proclamation. Good evening. This is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, California, in honor of Veterans Day 2011. Whereas the United States of America is a nation of diverse ethnicity, race, and creed who strive to live together in peace. And whereas this is an appropriate time for us to reflect on the many benefits and freedoms we enjoy as Americans. And whereas Veterans Day presents an opportunity to honor those who have defended the United States of America and its interests against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And whereas the residents of Crescent City desire to express their patriotism by demonstrating the unity of this community and recognizing United States veterans. Now therefore, it, therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Crescent City, California hereby pro proclaims November 11th, 2011 as a day of celebration to join together in paying tribute by showing our gratitude and respect to our veterans, particularly those who have paid the ultimate price for their loyalty and service. And then this is signed by our mayor, Charles Slurt. And uh, I would just uh, like to ask that anyone that is a veteran, if you would please stand. So on behalf of the council, we want to thank all of you for your service to our country. Thank you very much, Ms. Schwab. Mr. Ging, would you please come forward? You're welcome to say a few words if you'd like. Please. I would just urge that everybody come out this Friday to honor the veterans. This year we're having the parade starting at 11, which is the original hour that the armistice was signed back in 1918. So it was the 11th day, the 11th month, the 11th hour. Mm. So we're able this year, 11, 11, 11, to do it at 11. So it's a very significant day. Thank you on behalf of the Veterans Committee and all this community's veterans. Thank you. Thank you and for the nice coastal voices that you did, John. Thank you. And, and thanks for uh, stepping up and uh, participating and heading things up for these uh, events and ceremonies. And I would just offer uh, to, to the veterans, uh, thank you for your service uh, to our country. Um, it's not always easy, but, but we do it and we stand together. And uh, so thank you. Okay, at this time, we have uh, another uh, proclamation uh, to uh, honor the, the 10th anniversary of the Crescent City uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla. And could I have Bev? And Becky. Becky, join at the podium there, please. Uh, 
I'll read the proclamation. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, California, in honor of the 10th anniversary uh, of the Crescent City Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla. And is that 8-11? Whereas, after the sinking of the commercial fishing vessel uh, Paul C. in 1999 that resulted in the deaths of two local crab fishermen, both Bev Knoll and uh, Mary, uh, Mary uh, Messel, uh, uh, campaigned to have a, a U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla located in Crescent City. And whereas Ms. Knoll and Ms. Uh, Messel uh, trained 16 friends and relatives to be members of the auxiliary, and whereas due to those efforts, Crescent City became the home of the first U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Organization uh, to be an official Coast Guard watercraft in open Pacific Ocean waters for search and rescue operations. And whereas uh, Friday, November the 4th, 2011, marks the 10th anniversary uh, of the Crescent City Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla 8-11, and now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Crescent City, California, hereby acknowledges this 10th anniversary and applauds the hard work and dedication of uh, Ms. Bev Knoll and Ms. Mary uh, Messel, uh, who uh, brought the uh, auxiliary to our community, signed Charles Slurt, Mayor. Uh, reaching back, I was the very first flotilla commander, and Miss Barlow is our flotilla commander 10 years later now. And so we celebrate all of the ones that have been uh, through the years that uh, have brought this thing forward. So Mary and I stand very proud these days for the ones that have come up through the ranks here. And Ms. Barlow and her husband both are serving <coughs> as flotilla commander and vice flotilla commander. Uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Ms. Shalong for representing the city council at our 10th anniversary on Saturday night. We appreciated that. We like to have the, we're still pushing for a station. We still want a station here. We want more coverage for our Coast Guard and, and so that we can support them. So we're always looking for the support from the city, from the county, from the harbor, and from the fire department. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I would just offer <clears throat> that I want to extend my appreciation uh, to the myriad of commanders that you all have had. This is something like a half a dozen mm -hmm. over the last several years. And, and uh, all, all of the volunteers that also participate, right? Yes, it's because all volunteer. I, right. So thank you for making our local water safer because of your efforts. Uh, how, many yeah. how many volunteers do you have right now? 32. 32. 32. And, and you don't have to necessarily be um, a seaworthy person, you can, there's lots of uh, administrative things you can do, right? Right now we only have um, eight, three coxswains, five crew members. We've got two more we're training right now. The rest are all um, doing vessel examining, teaching classes, um, planning parties. parties. <laughs> um, I can do that. The vet, the, <laughs> our biggest thing that we um, do other than the search and rescue boat is like the life jacket giveaways that we do every year. And that's, and that's terrific. That's part of it. So. so we're looking for um, anyone that um, would like to join an organization. We'll find a spot for them. There's plenty of things to do. You know, we need uh, paperwork people. We need, you know, we need all types of, of people to come in, not just the search and rescue. Right. You could do this, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I've been invited to uh, before, and I seriously thought about it, but I'm a little extended right now. But I brought it up so that you could advertise that you can always use more Yes, help. yes. That's overextended is uh, like And you the can get a hold our... of one of us <laughs> or any one of our members, and we can sure get you in there, and you can come to a meeting, see what you feel like, see how comfortable it is. Whatever, we had a great meet and greet on uh, Friday night, and we had a wide uh, cross section of the community. And we did invite the Dutra uh, crew over off of the barges to thank them for all of their service to get our harbor back 
and safe uh, so that we can get our, we want our fleet home. We mm -hmm. need our fleet here. Very good. Mm -hmm. Is there any other comments by the council? I would just like to say that I really enjoyed the event on Saturday evening. Um, there was a, uh, it was at the Veterans Hall and it was well attended. I was really pleased to see that they had members of the Coast Guard here from as far away as Alameda. Um, so they had great uh, support and great stories to tell. Um, and I love the fact that you provide life jackets t to children in our community. Um, and the event, the high school jazz band was there and it just it was a very nice evening. So thank you. Any thoughts? This was okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we we will uh, move to the consent calendar, and we have seven items uh, for consideration. I'll move for approval of the consent calendar. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, aye. Sorry, I had a question on sure. item uh, eight. Did I miss the actual dates that you're choosing? Oh, is it December 19th and then January 3rd? December 19th would be uh, the additional meeting. meeting. No, it would be a regular council meeting. Original uh, approval for the meeting schedule uh, deleted December 19th. And I'd like to uh, add that. Okay, and cancel the January 3rd meeting. January. I got gotcha. you. Right, right. Okay. And then I was just curious um, does our handbook call for Friday, December 23rd, and uh, Friday, December 30th as paid holidays? There's two. Um, holidays through the um, season there and then there's two floating holidays that uh, the city manager um, schedules on the calendar and so the I don't have a calendar in front of me but I believe it was the two Fridays so there's basically we would be closed the two weekends uh, Friday and Monday. okay and our our employee handbook calls that for is, those as paid holidays that is correct Interesting. Thank you. Uh, also, um, although we've passed this, I just wanted uh, in uh, uh, passing, I wanted to mention that I had uh, some corrections that I filed with the city clerk for our joint uh, city and board of supervisors meeting. Um, so those should be noted in the future. And then uh, in uh, reviewing the uh, biweekly payroll report, um, I just want to uh, make mention of uh, the, the uh, police department uh, for the two-week effort uh, behind us. There was a $5,600 plus dollar, uh, rate for overtime. So I guess the point I want to make is um, I understand that a new officer uh, is being considered and going through the vetting process. If it takes another 30 or 45 days, uh, at that time, uh, with a new officer coming aboard, um, and that's my understanding that they would be riding around uh, for some period of time is the transition. But um, we're, we're on a path since July 1st to have paid for a half of a police, off police officer position uh, by the overtime that we've been paying. And um, remember, when we pay the overtime, uh, we're paying a premium for overtime, and uh, we're getting less coverage as compared to if we were just paying a straight uh, salary or hourly rate. Well, to add on to that, too, I would just ask that if you're going to go over budget, uh, over what the council has allowed for overtime for the police department, that that needs to be brought back to us. We're not over budget, though. What do you mean in the no, future? No, but on this pattern, we will be. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. At this time, we will, uh, there is no public hearing, and we have the uh, report. I think we need to vote. I don't think we voted. Oh. I thought I, I. I interrupted you. Okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> uh, we had a motion and a second, and uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Okay, so the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. So we have no uh, public hearing, and uh, at this time we have item number 12, uh, which is reports, and we will receive a PowerPoint presentation uh, from our uh, police chief uh, regarding uh, new mobile data terminals in the police units. Chief Black, welcome. Thank you. Evening. Good evening. Okay. Um, here to present to you uh, the new uh, mobile data terminals that we have uh, purchased uh, for the police cars. Uh, the, the MDTs is what they're usually referred to as. Um, this has been a long, drawn-out process. We started this in 2009. Uh, and we're able to secure funding uh, that paid for uh, items that also fortified the police department as well. Thank you. Uh, very important through Homeland Security. Uh, so far, we have uh, that fortified items at the police department, no cost to the city at all whatsoever. Uh, but this also included computers for the cars. This, what you're going to be seeing tonight, the city has not paid for any of these items. This is all through Homeland Security Grant. So at that time, uh, I requested the two most knowledgeable people who know more about computers, uh, such as IT, Fritz Ludeman, as well as Sergeant Apperson. I requested them to research, uh, investigate, select, and to install, not to mention implement a computer system that would benefit the police department, not now, but also capable to expand into the future technologies with upgrades. So the MDTs, uh, what is that? Well, it is a system in where mobile data terminal is a computerized device used in emergency vehicles for the purposes of communicating with other officers, data entry, and research as well. Now they are also used to display the mapping and the information uh, relevant to the tasks, such as uh, diagrams of the city, diagrams of the house, pictures of the house. All these things have been able to be incorporated into this system, uh, such as uh, CAD, which is our computer-aided dispatch drawings and diagrams for safety information. Uh, the mobile data terminals features a screen on which to view information, and it also has a keyboard in the front seat of the patrol car. Uh, for entering information and may be connected to various peripheral devices as well. As time goes on, we will implement that. The MDTs may be simple display and keypad units. They're intended to be connected to a separate computer. You will find in the police cars that there are actually two computers in each car, and Fritz will explain that a little bit later to you. Now, while the MDTs were originally dumb uh, terminals, most have been replaced with fully functional PC hardware, uh, known as MDCs, which is mobile digital computers. While the MDCs term is more correct, the MDT is still widely used. Other common terms include the MVC, which is the motor vehicle computer, and names of manufacturers such as the iMobile or the KDT. What is going to benefit the Crescent City Police Department in the city of Crescent City? Well, this is going to allow us to, this is going to allow us to access our Code 3 data system. This Code 3 data system is a standalone system that the police department has had over nine, ten years. And this system is our actual records system. This is where all the records get filed into every time a pol police report is made. Uh, it goes into this system. That is going to be accessible to the officers out on the street. Very important aspect. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, does that mean that if uh, someone uh, calls 911 and it's dispatched through the sheriff's department and a sheriff responds, the city can then look that information up on this? We can't. We, we don't have the connection with the, uh, the sheriff's department now. We still got to get the calls through the dispatch. 
It's not over the computer system at this point, at this moment. Even though later on we can do it through a secured system through the internet, we can do it that way as well. Or a third so party. that's not what the Code 3 data system is? Okay, thank you. That we also had digital map and other orientation storage on there, such as layouts of apartment complexes, layout of the school districts, uh, all the schools within the city, limits, stores, things of that nature. Uh, we're also able to have car-to-car -car communications with each officer. Uh, with these systems as well. What's important here also, we also have access to law enforcement related websites such as drug paraphernalia, pills officers come across during, uh, during their, their shift. They're almost able to identify all types of drugs that are available out there by popping up these uh, websites that are available in the car. Uh, we also have a GPS coordinates so every officer able to uh, relate the location that they are at the time the call comes out. So that's really going to be beneficial as well, not only for calls for service, but for officer safety as well. It also allows us to be able to dictate which officer is closest to the call that maybe can take the call instead as well. So we would cut down our response time as well, which we're very proud of, which is around two minutes. Uh, the user friendly for the driver and the passenger uh, you will see that there's a number of configurations on the car uh, computer in where it can be moved around uh, depending on who's the driver and or whether or not there is another officer in the car. One thing that really concerned me a great deal is that uh, we used to have the computers in the cars and there was a big post sitting right in the middle of the passenger seat. So therefore, you couldn't have ride-alongs, you couldn't have a training of a new officer in the car because it was just not conducive for someone sitting there. This is a little bit different. That takes it away and centers it uh, over the console, which was very much uh, beneficial to us. It has a hot button, and when an officer appears on the scene, he can push a button, and we're more time uh, sensitive than we are before. Uh, so when they push that button, they know that this is when they got the call, this is when they uh, arrived on the scene and this is when they cleared. So it was a little bit more accurate than the way it was before. Also the touch screen and extremely durable. Uh, this system that we've uh, uh, decided on uh, is really going to be very impressive. Once you see it, that's a picture of, uh, of uh, Unit 66. That is the only unit that has a computer at this time. We wanted to see what all of you thought about and see the capabilities before we go forward on it. But we also wanted to get out the bugs out of it as well. Now, some quick facts. A total of four of these units have been purchased for the use of the patrol cars. So we have four of them ready to go, but we wanted to iron out the bugs on Unit 66 first. These uh, computers are Panasonic Toughbooks, uh, which is really a predominant use in law enforcement and the fire department as well. They are very durable and very uh, uh, capable of handling the, the, uh, the abuse that it's going to take as well. Uh, each unit costs $5,000. Uh, so therefore, it's really quite a substantial savings for the city uh, known. And here you have $20,000 worth of computers and brought to you by the Federal Government Homeland Security Grants, which is wonderful. It's helping us a great deal to help us come up into the 21st century as far as computer-aided dispatch, as far as law enforcement is concerned. Doug, is this compatible with the what's in the fire trucks? Uh, I, I think, I don't. Is, is it compatible with what you have in the fire trucks? So, And, and, and at time it will, the same way it will be in time with the Sheriff's Department as well. But right now, we're just trying to get this up and running for right now and, and be able to look at all the possibilities that the future is going to bring as far as the technology is concerned. Uh, the, uh, the units were purchased, like I mentioned before, by funds by Homeland Security Grant. Uh, keep in mind, even though you're going to be seeing the, the installation on Unit 66, each unit is going to be a little bit different because the cars between the years, even though it's the same make, same model, 
uh, the conf um, configurations inside the car is a little bit different, but all in all, it's relatively the same. Uh, as I mentioned, there's one MDT currently installed in the Crescent City Police Department Unit 66 and is already being used. How's it and, working? I'm sorry? How's it working? Well, you will find out because that's the end of my presentation and Fritz is outside waiting for you. Council would what? like, we have a demonstration uh, waiting for you if you want to recess and take a quick look. I, I just had a quick question. Yes. Um, it, it seems that uh, clearly the most desirable would be that ultimately if the PD and the fire department could cross communicate and the sheriff right. with you all that from a local uh, public safety standpoint, that'd be the optimum. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'd like to see the cost of making that dispatch available to the PD. I know we've talked about it. So I know there's a cost. So I'd like to see what that number is. And also, um, I would think our next priority would be the in-car cameras and the microphone system for the officers. Uh, funny you should mention that. Uh, we ordered four uh, of the body mics through Homeland Security as well. Good. But you're talking about the in-car camera system for the cars, and we don't have any... Uh, any makeup on that. I know which system we'd like to have, but uh, we certainly have been testing them. But we don't have. It just seems that. like with the, the lawsuits we've witnessed recently that having that backup information would certainly protect the officers. Also, I, I want to make you aware of that this does not give the officers the ability to pull a vehicle over know who owns the vehicle, run it through the, uh, the Kletz machine, which is the California Law Enforcement uh, Telecommunication System. That still needs to be done at the dispatch center. We don't have that uh, um, up and running because it takes a third independent party to bring that together. And, so you uh, can't look up their license plate number? Nor the driver's license. We still have to call that in. And these are the things that we're going to be working on to advance in the future. So. Also, Chief, I wanted to clarify, uh, is this something that uh, Homeland Security just offers to everybody and anybody in law enforcement, or is this something that you actually go and, and track down and then apply for? Well, Homeland Security, this particular grant is really offered every single year. What we do is we sit down with the fire departments, uh, the sheriff's department, uh, and the police department to sit down and say, okay, you know, where's the majority of the money going to? And at that time, that year, uh, we all agreed that it was the Crescent City Police Department that needed it the most. This past one was the fire department where they got a lot of the, uh, the funding from it. So we take turns around it, but we still get a little bit of uh, equipment here and there for that. But this is something that's really brought up every year for the Homeland Security. How long it's going to last, I don't know. But uh, also this year, we also obtained another computer, which will be the fifth computer, and we will continue with adding one per year as well as upgrades whenever we can every year. I'd rather see the cameras. Excuse me? I'd rather see the cameras in the car. I just think it's, uh, it will save a lot more money down the road. I actually like the computers in the car because when they're able to run those plates, they'll find out if it's stolen well before dispatch has a chance to tell you. And if we have the cameras on the uniform, that's one camera that we already have. Yeah, but he just said that they can't run the plate. No, he said they will be able to eventually. They're just not hooked okay. up yet. There's a lot of upgrades that we still need to be needs to work on. And I don't believe it's going to be all that expensive to, once we have that, to be able to run it through the, the Internet you know, a secured line from the sheriff's department you know, to the police department. The question is, we can't get it out into the cars because of the restrictions that the Department of Justice has on, on the clets for right now. So, Chief, I think that the cameras would provide a safety for you as well. And um, But with this system that we have that you're proposing for the other three cars, um, can the second officer be working on their reports 
at, you know, if they finish the call and they're wrapping things up, is that part yes, of that? Yes, they don't have to come into the police department. That's the beauty of the whole thing. So, and if you have a two-person unit, one can be driving, the other one can be doing the report. Doing so it makes reports. it more efficient too. Yeah. Oh, that's so we great. keep the officers more out on the street. Yes, because otherwise, right now, anytime there's any type of paperwork, they got to come in, mm -hmm. come in off the street, and that's the last thing. They so you're saying they can do the report on this computer? They can, yes, they can do the report on this. Yes. Good. Good to know. Right. And I understand you, you've been pretty busy recently, so I want yes, to we we thank you again for you and, and your team's service to protect us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, while we have you, <laughs> okay. speaking of uh, all of the burglaries in our community, what is the plan? Are we having, I think it seems to me it's just become so prevalent is a good word, um, that the sheriff department and the city and even the prison, because I know that they're involved, um, should be sitting down together, coming up with some kind of a plan to address the safety of our community. Well, every month I meet with the sheriff and the commander for CHP. Every month we talk about it. the majority of the burglaries is happening in the county. Uh, we're not getting as hit as much in the city as well. Or not. I um, mean, it's just the county. It's in a remote area. Well, it's not just the county. Um, <laughs> we, we have our share, but we don't have all the ones that have been reported. Well, I still think that we could uh, work with them to come up with some kind of a way to combat this. Well, we do. We assist each other on that. When we've covered the sheriff's department on numerous times, uh, when they don't have a deputy available, that's why you'll see officers outside the, uh, the city limits. We're constantly backing each other up, We're constantly backing up CHP, the sheriff's department, particularly on hot calls. That's one of the reasons why you have two officers on, you know, on the city. So one is always in the city and the other one can respond out to assist. I understand. Okay. I, well, I guess what I'm asking is, are you sitting down and communicating about the facts of the cases so that we're all on the same page and can maybe stop some of this yes there's uh there's bolos that put out between the officers and the deputies as to what to look forward uh look for such as vehicles suspects description of suspects things of that nature absolutely because there's a lot of of information going around and and i don't know if it's true or rumors or what and i think that um the community needs to hear from our law enforcement and, and I would also note that uh, you're doing this backup and coverage uh, being three uh, police officers down at this time with light duty. Well, I actually, with light duty and injury and, and vacancies, it's, it's more than that. So. And as you recall, we eliminated a police officer position. Excuse me? And as you recall, this council eliminated a police officer position that we're going to revisit again. We just authorized him to hire. Hire one vacancy. We eliminated one position. We eliminated our 14th officer out of the budget. Is that true, Mr. Palazzo? I thought we had 13 officers. We do. We had 14 on the ship. The budget approved 13 police officer positions, and we are hiring the 13th one currently. But last year, we were authorized 14. In the year before that, we eliminated one position. Police Chief, I have a question. Yes. I had a meeting with some uh, property owners, um, and they expressed a concern that we may be creating ghettos by building these low income apartments behind Walmart and now behind Ace. And when I hear you talk about the city police back up the county, is there a high incidence of burglaries, drug usage, and vandalism in these areas? Well, here again, that's the county's jurisdiction. Yeah, but I know. I think that uh, I cannot really speak on how many calls for service they've had over there. I do know that there's been substantial, uh, but um, it's an area in where you have a lot of people that come from the city to move over there, probably because of the crime-free multi-housing. Uh, we're we're on our sixth one right now, and it's, uh, it has certainly impacted them over there on those new apartments over there, sure. Well, and I hate to have people stereotype low-income people as ghetto. Yeah, well, I don't believe that. Uh, I, 
I just believe that everyone is uh, should be given the opportunity to live in a crime-free environment, particularly the children. And I don't believe, you know, uh, you know, low rent equals low life. I just, I just don't believe it. I, so, I, yeah, no, I, I've been in the crime, uh, the um, Hidden Creek apartments when I was working for RHS, and they're not. I don't perceive them to be run down or anything and I know that they do have a drug free policy out there um, by the owners and the management so yeah, I, I don't enforce that I don't know what they have out there only thing I know is I monitor the radio too and it seems the county does go out there an awful lot yes now what are the reasons for that they go out there I don't know so are we going to recess and go see a patrol car if, uh, let's do that or about five minutes? Be fine. He's sitting there waiting for you. It's Very on good. the north end. We'll recess for five minutes to see the police unit.
We'll uh, reconvene the uh, city council meeting at this time and uh, let the others uh, join us. Um, something that I thought was uh, valuable um, that, that the chief mentioned out there in reviewing the vehicles is that uh, these uh, systems will uh, adapt over time. So they might be here a lot longer than all the rest of us. Uh, which is uh, good to know. And, and uh, actually also we learned out there that the Frontier people use the exact same systems. So uh, it sounds like it's all good uh, for public safety ultimately, which is about communication. So I appreciate that uh, presentation and that tour. Any thoughts or comments by the council? happy to see us installing them and I think that'll be a nice safety feature and efficiency feature very good so at this time we'll move uh, forward with uh, communication <clears throat> and we'll have a public comment period uh, any member of the audience is invited to address the City Council on any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the city of Crescent City comments of public interest or on matters appearing on the agenda are accepted Note, however, that the council is not able to undertake extended discussion or act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to the staff for appropriate action, which uh, may include placement on a future agenda. Any comments that are not at the microphone are out of order and will not be uh, part of the public record. After receiving recognition from the mayor, please state your name and the city or county residency for the record and public comment is limited to three minutes. Public comment, please. Good Welcome. My name is Jenny Allen, and I've got a report here that I've been looking into about some toxic waste. I'll read you a portion of the report. This report describes the monitoring of well sampling done by the Del Norte County Health and Human Services Department, the Environmental Health Unit. The monitoring of well sampling was done pursuant to an agreement between the Del Norte County State California Department of Toxic Substance Control, DISC, and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. The site history states the Del Norte pesticide storage area is located approximately one mile north of the Crescent City, California, and is adjacent to the Jack McNamara Field. The county airport, the site is relatively flat and lies approximately 42 feet above mean sea level. The groundwater has been estimated to flow to the southeast towards the city. The pesticide storage area was established as a point of consolidation, consolidation for pesticide containers in Del Norte County. The containers were rinsed on site and improper rinse disposal resulted in soil and water contamination. Groundwater treatment by EPA conducted for a number of years. The treatment facility has been decommissioned and removed. As part of the consent decree between DISC, EPA and the Del Norte County, Del Norte County Health and Social Services Department, Environmental Health Section, is to conduct semi-annual sampling of the four remaining monitoring wells for 1-2-dichlorpropane. Two dumping wells remain at the site, but no sampling of these wells has been done. Is this in, in the county? Mm-hmm. City. No, it's not. The airport's in the county. It's not our. The airport is in the county, uh -huh. but we have county members who are also on the city council. Airport members. All of the city council members are city residents. It flows towards the city. The water flow goes goes towards the city. Maybe for clarification, um, <clears throat> there has been a, a previous identified. Uh, toxic or hazardous site that I believe uh, was a result of 
uh, I think, dumping of pesticides over years in the past. And it's my understanding that phase one of that cleanup has been executed. And so there is a specific process in place for the ongoing monitoring and the next phase of work. Well, will the people be notified when this is? And how long will these chemicals last in our soil? I mean, they la can last ages and hundreds and thousands of years even. I want to know. I'm afraid of being poisoned. I don't want cancer. I don't want all this contaminants in my body. I have a hard enough time living as it is. The air I breathe is bad enough just from the cars. Okay. Why should I get it in my water and in my food? Very good. Thank Please you, Jenny. Help me. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, could I, I just would, would like to comment because I, I happen to know a lot about this. Mr. Black, please. This was a, <clears throat> this was a super fun site. It was owned by the county. The pesticides were allowed to be de the containers, not the pesticides per se, but the containers were rinsed uh, at the ag department, which is also the, where you go out for animal control. It's basically the pound site and the cleanup was completed and it's now in a phase of simple monitoring. Uh, these test wells, which are there for the purpose of detecting migration of this stuff in the soils. And the county entered into a settlement agreement with the EPA, which provides that there will be no residential development within a mile of the site unless the water at that residential development is tested or unless it's put on city water. So, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a source of concern, except the very reason that they have these monitoring wells is to detect any mobilization or movement of this material. And uh, I think that, in, I don't know what exactly that information is showing today, but in the past, it's shown to be pretty stable. It's just sitting there. So is, was this part of the brownfield uh, cleanup? No, it was actually a super fund. Okay. How long ago was that? Well, I think that the depositing of the materials stopped in the 80s, and the super fund site was declared about 1993, and there was actually a lawsuit, and there was you know back and forth between the county and the EPA. So it, it got settled, but it, it never has been considered to be a city issue. It's a county issue. Thank you very much for that clarification. Does that help? A little, I think. First thing I would suggest is you go talk with the county, since it's well, in their well, jurisdiction. It into the city. No, I, I would suggest you go and talk to Excuse me. Thank you. Connie Morrison from the county. I suggest you go and talk to the county and find out what is flowing into your city and your citizens' water. And there's also a dump site over by the Mary Peacock School, and if it's running southeast, there was an incident, I guess, where the workers dumped toxins um, right near the school uh, by Black uh, by Dead Lake. Um, I'm surprised that Mayor Slurt doesn't know about it, or Kelly, are you, your original, I think, I think Kelly's originally from here. Um, I was talking to somebody else who, was, who knows a lot about the dumping of the toxins at Black Lake area. There was a big incident that came up, this was probably maybe 15, 20 years ago. I moved here in 1991. Ah, okay, before your time, before my time, definitely. But. Um, the point is, there's still lots of cancer happening. And another friend of mine just died of aplastic anemia, which is, they don't know really what caused it, but they do uh, know that uh, um, benzene and pesticides are a big contrib co contributor to aplastic anemia. Um, and I don't know that many people in the county or the city, and three people that I've met are dead. Uh, and it's all from toxins. And then when I find things that come up, uh, it really bothers me. Uh, when I don't know anything about the toxins, and to find this, it's right there by the airport, and it's coming southeast. Harvey lived on Mur Murray Street, Murphy Street, and um, Mike lived on California by Hastings. And um, 
uh, if it's flowing that way. When they, and the other thing, it's checked by Dr. The Health Man. Who's your public health guy? Is he elected or appointed? Dr. Uh, Martinelli. 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 Is he appointed or elected? He's just an employee sure. of the county. I've never heard of him, never seen him, never heard anything he had to say except when we asked him about the he's fluoride. He's condition. a retired doctor. He was an internal medicine doctor here in Crescent City for years and then... So he hasn't had a whole lot of experience out in the big world and he's old, I take it. He's retired. I mean, there's, you know, as you get older, new things do happen and you have to consider the new blood. At least I do. Uh, I'm known as a tech tard by my family. Um, I don't know anything about tech. Uh, Kelly, I saw your name at the airport as a commissioner at the airport. Is that a paid for position? Um, I see a conflict of interest there, and the attorney also, I believe you're on the airport commission too, and the harbor, and the city, and speaking of, you know, to get varied opinions, and, and, and uh, it seems like to be on the airport commission, you'd be pushing to have the airport come in, and to be a city council person, you'd be pushing for the health and, and welfare of the citizens, and I see a conflict right there. Uh, especially since I found a toxic wa another toxic waste dump. And by the way, over on um, Miller or McNara and Peep behind Safeway, that place, I talked with them and they said that they spent $2,000 cleaning it up, but they never took any tests since then to see if it is in fact still leaching into the soil and Elk Creek and the harbor. And um, Connie, I'm sorry, you're timed up. Okay. And uh, whoever buys it, it'll be they'll be liable to do those tests. There's no more funds for tests. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, could I just make one more comment? Please. The city doesn't have any wells. All of the city water that you drink comes from the Smith River through pipes. Thank you, Mr. Black, for that clarification. And why are you saying that? Why am I saying that? <laughs> because even if the even if as i just explained to you they have test wells to show that there's no migration of this material from the ag site but even if it did migrate it's not being pumped up out of the ground it's under the ground the water that we drink comes from pipes from the smith river thank you mr gitlin Good evening, council members. I'm Roger Getlin. I'm a resident of the city. I was going to come here tonight and talk to you a little bit about solid waste and subjects have changed a little bit. Um, I'm so glad Chief Black came here tonight to deliver that news about Department of Homeland Security technology. Uh, I was chatting with the chief at uh, the farmer's market the other day and how we can improve our city. And I am of the strongest opinion that we need to maximize every grant dollar possible. And I communicated that to Chief Plack and to City Manager Gene Palazzo that if we are not prioritized in accessing this money from Washington or Sacramento or wherever it comes from, then we're missing the boat. Um, we're small county, small city. And uh, the City Manager responded that they're right on top of it, which makes me feel that this is good news. Uh, I personally would like to see, I heard a lot of talk about the police department, which I consider to be the face of our community, that its numbers need to increase <clears throat> substantially. Uh, we are two cities. We are a city in the summer months where our population increases two and three times, and we are a city now where population decreases. And what happens during the day when the population increases in our city, when people go home into the county? So I'm of the strongest opinion we need more police officers and they need to be paid commensurately with competition. And so this is going to be your challenge as you move into the new uh, fiscal year 2012. How are we going to get this extra money? And that's when I uh, pose the idea of the grant money and how we can maximize those dollars. So having said that, I wanted to communicate to you that that's, as I see it in this city, that's a priority. Now the other issue, I wanted to just tuck, quickly touch on solid waste, and I want to express my extreme gr gratitude to Kevin Hendricks, um, who was more than cooperative in a very quick manner. Um, two Mondays ago, I asked <clears throat> uh, 
uh, Supervisor Hemmingson for these audit reports. Uh, he made a quick phone call to uh, Auditor Shad, who did not have them in his possession. He, he informed me that uh, the the uh, uh, Mr. Hendricks had them, and I called him that afternoon. It was a Monday afternoon, and um, he said, I'll get them for you, and he did. And when I went to pick them up on Wednesday, which was less than 48 hours later, he had a, didn't have a smile on his face. And I asked him, I said, well, thank you very much. What's wrong? Was I understand, Mr. Gitlin, you're, you're upset that you, someone said you were complaining, that you didn't get these audit reports. So I said, no, sir, I'm not complaining. I'm congratulating you. And please be careful who you listen to, because people tend to mongerize things and rumor monger. And so right now, I see government working extremely well. I am not unhappy, and our members of our Tea Party group are not unhappy that we have these reports in our hand, and we are going through them. And I just want to say thank you to the city and the county for doing your job. So having said that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gitlin. Is there a public comment? Roger, I'd just like to, s oh, sorry. I'd just like to say that um, our police budget is the largest percentage of our budget. We have a lot of services to provide to the community, and I believe our police budget is about 25% of our budget, if not more. 50? It's more than 25. Okay, I haven't. Can't respond? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll talk to you afterwards. I just want to let you know, it's 50%, I said 25, uh, it's 50% of our budget. It's 5-0? Oh. I know it's large. See, I, yeah. was, I wasn't that off. Welcome. Between 25 and 50. Good evening. Mary McGinnis, and I'm at Seawood, so I guess that's county, although we're affected by city waters and all that stuff. Um, I had a public announcement, and uh, that is that a co-worker of mine and very good friend was losing her house to foreclosure, and she got in touch with an organization called TILASolutions.com, and Tuesday they went to court, and I got an email. I opened it Saturday. It said, we won the house. We won the house. So there is hope for people who are in foreclosure. I know that many of my coworkers with our 15% cut that we weren't counting on, thank you, Uncle Arnold, um, have lost their homes. And I mean, that's, that's I work out of the prison. Um, it's hit this community hard, the economy has. And uh, there is hope. TILASolutions.com saved my coworker's house and uh, that of her three children. So there is, there is hope. The other thing, I, I had a question for you, if I could, sir. Go through him. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how this works. Um, my concern is that um, when we were doing the uh, wastewater treatment plant and we had the conflict of, uh, of everyone not wanting their rates to go up and such, uh, it seemed to me that there was a young man that worked out at the wastewater treatment plant who said that 90% uh, of the problems could be solved if we dug up all the old pipes and replaced them with new ones and the cost would be greatly less than 42 plus million dollars which is what we actually what 43 million something now um, my concern is that if all those pipes have cracks in them what's to say that our water pipes coming from the Smith River don't have cracks in them and the uh, poisons that we've discovered online uh, are not moving through the water table of the southeast way into our our pipes in our drinking water. That I, I, I don't Can I know. answer that, Mayor? Please. Thank you. Water is checked every day. That's why we have a laboratory there. They check the water every day. Fantastic. Is yeah. there any hope of getting fluoride out of our water? That's, that'll have to be at another election because it was elected by the people. It was a petition by the people, and the council can't change that. It has to be by the people in the city. Thank orders. you for your time. I appreciate it. TILASolutions.com saved Jen's house. Thanks, Mary. Is there other public comment? Please. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Will Burge. I'm the general manager for Frontier Communications, and I'm a resident of Reedsport, Oregon, uh, Douglas County. Um, I'm here to give an update on Frontier Communications. We purchased the Verizon properties, which include Delmar County, 
uh, on July of 2010, so roughly a little over a year and a half later, made some great strides. We have, um, uh, we have uh, established high-speed internet connections for some 12,000 homes and businesses here on the coast, around 7,500 of which just this year in Del Mar County. And so we're really happy about that. We have recently rolled out um, a state-of-the-art Metro E true ethernet solution um, to the Yurok tribe, but is available throughout the county. Now, um, we brought 500 jobs back to the United States, so we have no out-of-the-country call centers. We're a 100% US-based company, and um, uh, we have a 25% uh, returning veteran rehire program. So uh, of all the new hires that we have made in, across the country in 26 states, 25% of those have been returning veterans. Um, in addition to that, um, we have increased our headcount here on the coast by 15% just since um, we took over in July of 2010. And we're continuing to grow. And, and uh, the last part of that announcement is uh, part of that growth is we are reopening the old GT Phone Mart, Phone Mart 2.0, we might call it, uh, <laughs> the Frontier Experience Center here on H Street. We're really happy about that. It's been closed about 10 years, mm -hmm. and um, we heard from the residents that it would be a welcome site. We reopened the one in Coos Bay last May. It has done very well, and we're very excited about opening this one on November or December 3rd, a Saturday. Be having a grand opening celebration with live music and um, street rods and Santa Claus, and uh, we're uh, you know we haven't termed it that, but it's going to be sort of a frontier palooza. So we invite you all to come down and and check out the store and celebrate with us uh, the reopening of um, a uh, sorely missed store, and we're really excited about the growth that we're making here in Del Norte County, and we hope to continue. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Will. And uh, I've seen you at the uh, local bid uh, meetings and got a chance to speak with you. And uh, we're very happy that you're here. And, and uh, Frontier is back and uh, making a great contribution to our downtown. So thank you. Well, thank you. Is there a public comment? OK, seeing none, we'll close public comment. And. We have uh, no uh, continuing business, so we have one new business item, uh, item number 13, which is consider and approve a resolution entitled resolution number 2011-40, a resolution establishing a payment plan for the financing of sewer and water capacity charges. And uh, <clears throat> a couple things that I would offer is uh, this is a response uh, to a request on the part of council member Sh uh, Shalong um, to look at ways to uh, incentivize, if you will, um, our water and or sewer programs. And I also want to applaud uh, Mr. Palazzo and the staff for being very responsive and coming back with some ideas. Mr. Palazzo. Yeah, turn it all over to uh, Mr. Black. He uh, spearheaded this and prepared the, the information provided to the council this evening. He's a good man, too. <laughs> Mr. Black. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd better keep my mouth shut so you don't want to take that back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, uh, hopefully this is somewhat self-explanatory. Uh, the idea here is that uh, if you approve this program, you're approving the, uh, the plan, the document that's attached, entitled the plan, and uh, attached to the plan itself is a sample of a document that would be entered into between the city and the owner of real property. Uh, that document would be recorded and would be a lien against the real property until these capacity charges uh, or the payment for the capacity charges are uh, is made in full. And uh, this document would be uh, entered into at the time of a building permit. So a person taking out a building permit would either pay cash or they would enter into the payment plan uh, as a condition of getting the building permit. Um, and I'm pleased to discuss with you any questions, concerns, or the terms that we're talking about here. Ms. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, I just, you know, since we have um, increased our sewer capacity charges, we've seen, well, and I'm sure a lot of it is in relationship to, you know, our economy, our down economy, but I've seen a decrease in um, hookups to the system. And, uh, you know, I'm out and about a lot talking to people and business people and uh, many of them have said if, you know, we don't mind paying the charge, but sometimes if it's, you know, a multi um, hookup, it becomes quite expensive. And it sometimes will stop a project or stop someone from building a home. <laughs> Is that important? <laughs> And um, so I thought it would, it would be prudent of us to come up with some ideas on how to help facilitate people that want to start a business here in town um, or build low income housing or whatever the case may be. Maybe it's just that they build their first home um, to uh, see if there was a feasible financial way to structure an agreement that would help our community. Um, so I'm extremely happy to see this. Um, I had a couple questions, uh, mostly um, in relationship to our business model for the wastewater treatment plant and how many of these agreements um, could we financially do feasibly um, without putting a strain on our enterprise fund and um, did we want to um, revisit this also maybe in a year those are good questions uh, probably more appropriate for the city manager or for finance department I can take a shot at that those two questions very good questions uh, yeah I think we do, should definitely revisit this uh, in a year from now let's see uh, what type of uh, opportunities you know, property owners have taken you know, to enter into agreements like this you know we're not sure if you know we're gonna get you know people uh, knocking down our doors coming in uh, to participate or if it's going to be a slow trickle uh, in order to I think we need to evaluate it's it's a five-year you know term on these agreements and at times you know possibly extend that out to ten years uh, we will eventually receive you know that money back uh, we have not done an analysis on number of units or, or how much and I think we would have to cut you to come back to the council on that I, I don't believe Brenda, Ken, if you have anything off the top of your head you know, with our uh, bond debt and impact fees yeah. Ken has a you know a a, a number <laughs> Off the top of your head, you know, yeah, that. we haven't looked at it in detail because in our long-range forecasts, it's, we've studied studied for our rates. We've looked at a certain amount. Well, this year we've gone over it. It's kind of an, been an moving target, but I think the theory is is that some of these projects that maybe wouldn't go through would go through because we end up underwriting and financing their connection fees that they have to pay up front before they even make one dollar. Right, and and it would it would still show as an asset under accounts receivable for. Right, and we would still have it. We would be collecting if, in theory, when we get a, the majority of those connection fees, we should be accumulating that money for the next phase. You know, I think it was ten or twenty years down the road. So that's kind of why we base it on our LAFE rate, which is what our investment rate is. And to deal with some of our administrative time, we put a one percent amount on there. When the rates are super low, it's not going to amount to much, but. It is going to get the trickle of, of funds coming in, and the way we've structured it was where a present, I think it was 25 or 30 percent came up front. So it does get some money in up front when we need 10. it. And 10 percent. 10 percent down yeah, payment. There was a small yeah. down payment right. part of it. So. Well, and I'm extremely supportive of it. I just don't want to see us get into um, you know a situation where um, maintenance you know, gets put off because we financed a large amount of connections. So I just want to see us monitor it very closely. Definitely. Um, well, everybody knows how financially conservative I am. So <laughs> this is going to be a, basically a two-part thing. I'm going to have to be real warm and fuzzy before I'm going to sign on with it. And this isn't a guarantee. Nobody gets this guaranteed. So Get they're going to have to. Get warm and fuzzy, Ken. I'll try to be, but 
It's harder okay, to be a cold spell here. But, I, so I think it's something that we can kind of evaluate as we're going and see how it progresses. I mean, we could get, not likely here, but you know, in some of the large urban areas, they get thousand unit subdivisions coming through and any developer would love to get low interest financing on anything. Those are probably ones where we might not be eligible. I don't think we're gonna see those types of things here, but we did have a restaurant that came in and with the number of connections and the service they wanted to provide, it was gonna be a $100,000 amount for a restaurant to pay before they even constructed or you know, were even able to serve a customer. So it's very progressive and I think it will help in this down economy to keep our connection fee up where it needs to be, but help everybody to mitigate the- I love what you just said. Which part? It's progressive, it, but it will, you know, we'll still get the money, but it will mitigate, you know, the problems that people are seeing before they can open yeah, a business. By putting the lien on the property, it truly ties it in. So mm -hmm. if it is a tenant, it's going to have to have the property owner's involvement in it. So it really does put the responsibility where it needs to be, protects our interests, and, and helps co-partnership with some of these things to start up because right. we're going to get the revenue as they start in business too. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just briefly summarize this so that if someone is listening or if they read our minutes, um, that they understand what this council is trying to do for the community. Um, so and if you have a, a business or um, a apartment complex or uh, a, some kind of development and you need assistance for the uh, sewer connections, you can now do that, uh, possibly do that with the city with a finance director and the city manager's approval. Um, it's a $300 application fee. Um, interest would be payable to our local agency investment fund um, rate plus 1%. You are only required to have a 10% down payment. The payment period would be uh, established in the agreement with the user, but would most likely be monthly so that the city could simply bill the user along with the user's monthly user fee. Uh, approval would be in the city manager's discretion and the financing could be made available for all or a portion of the charges. No building permit would uh, issue until the capacity charges are either paid in cash or an executed payment plan recorded. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity for those that may have been thinking about opening a business or developing um, their land and was, you know, couldn't do it financially. So thank you. Thank you for that clear, clarification. Go ahead. I was just going to say, but there's another part of this proposal for um, people who have their bill in the arrears. And um, so I was wondering, on page two of three, item number two, um, where, where it talks about um, if you're 12 months behind before you can have a payment plan approved, the customer must have paid the equivalent of the most recent three months of utility charges on a current basis. And I, I'm not sure if that um, will be that doable for some people if they're that far behind. So um, I'm wondering if we could maybe modify that part. Or what the justification yeah. is. Where is that on, on page well, two? It's at the top. It's item number two right above item uh, C. That's not in the memo. Which, which one? It's not in the memo. She must be referring to the resolution. It's the City of Crescent City Payment Plan Program for Water and Wastewater Charges. After the resolution. Is that, is that, new? Is that a new thing, Ken, or has that been in there? Uh, this, is all this, this, this whole thing is now. Oh. The whole, oh. um, so I put that in. I put that in because if you have somebody that generates a very substantial arrearage and then they want to enter into a payment plan, it seemed like they should, the proof of their ability to meet the payment plan is that they have been paying the last three months of current charges. Otherwise, it would kind of seem to me like there's a danger that the person who's in arrears is simply extending out their ability, you know, another few months of their ability not to pay. Oh, here it is. And uh, so remember, when they go on the payment plan, they're going to, if, if, if it's one of these arrearage situations, they have to pay their current user fee 
and the amount that's being financed on the payment plan. And so what we're saying is show us that for the last three months you've at least paid the user fee because you're asking us to take on faith more or less that you're going to pay your current user fee and the payment plan amount going forward for the next five years. So it's kind of a, it's a combination of good faith and a, like a financial test. So this isn't someone that's behind in their monthly sewer bill? Yes, it bill. is. Yes, it is. So it doesn't make sense then. No. Yeah, I know was someone well, that wanted this is a, cut them this off is before 12 months. Yeah. Sorry. We would try to collect before that. Yeah. So this is just a, like the. This is an alternative to just cutting them off. But okay. we. So if you think of maybe an ongoing business in the community that has fallen into arrears, you have the right to just shut them down and close their doors. But do we want to do that? Or would we like to give them an out where they can keep their doors open, stay in business, pay their current, they have to pay their current fees. I mean, that's like a condition of everything is everybody has to pay their current user charge. And we're going to give you like a one-time shot at developing a payment plan, negotiating with the city manager and the finance director. Is how are you going to come up by your bootstraps and pull yourself out of this? But I don't think we've ever let somebody go 12 months unless we've put them on the tax roll. Have we? The only, the only utility accounts that have been put on the tax roll are sewer onlys because they have no water to shut off. Right. This allows us to take a past due amount, which by just the current standard, you get a bill, it's due in 30 days, by that time you get another bill. By the time you shut somebody off, you're looking at at least two months of service. Right. Um, but what you have is the past due amount, you have the ability to securitize it, meaning tie it to the property. If you walk, if, if you end up going three months and having your bill shut off, uh, this is a business, so it's going to be a lot larger than that. Your water shut off. Water shut off. It, you're going to be going after that entity without any security. It, you basically, whatever deposit you would have collected, and that's only going to be for new businesses, say the business has been here for 10 years, they theoretically shouldn't have any deposits on their account at all. So then you would have to take a civil suit to go after collections on them. If you have this method of getting it put on a lien on the property, now you have a way of securitizing that so our financial risk has been mitigated because we have some collateral that we're going to get collected on. Where normally your service, you, you can, you know, there's no collateral with it so you have to cut off the service so that you don't keep extending your risk and making the financial loss be larger. I get that, but I don't get the time frame. I don't get the 12 months. We're not going to let somebody go 12 months without paying their sewer bill and then say, oh, we'll put you on a payment plan after a year. We will do our best not to have that happen, absolutely. Well, I don't mind allowing a payment plan, but I think that needs to happen way before they get to be a year behind. No, no one said it had to be 12 months arrearage. It's just in. Of at least 12 months. Yeah, it says oh, existing customers yeah, yeah, of the yeah. city service right. who have an arrearage in service payments of at least 12 months. We don't want to let anybody may enter into a payment plan. We don't want to let anybody get that far. We, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, my that's, point. That's is why it doesn't make sense. I don't think it would be doable if they're that far behind. Then they're in big trouble anyway. Is what I was thinking. So. In in concept, though, uh, uh, the, the the overall resolution is trying to. Uh, be a correct response and, and be uh, business friendly and and I guess I see it uh, on some levels being a work in progress I mean we really don't know how things are going to shake out but it's a step in a direction uh, where we're trying to be more business friendly in this uh, tough economic uh, environment and I like the idea of you know let's review this uh, in a year it's adopted by a resolution we can do uh, course corrections you know, add or delete from this uh, as we see needed, as we you know, work with one or two you know, businesses that come to the community or in the community that would like to utilize this. And the resolution looks more flexible than the, um, the, the program outline to me. So we could see how it goes, like you said. And it real, I mean, not just well, for our businesses, but for our families as well. 
it becomes another financial tool because right now we don't have that ability no, so it's I either like shut it. off or not and if I it's a business I mean we've had a couple that have went through some bankruptcies and financial restructuring and so um, by court order we we can't shut them off so we have had a few that have gone to that point they've all kind of come back from that but you know keeping their doors open is the key yes I agree uh, Mr. Mayor, I yes, have a few please. comments to make. Please. And for Gene's benefit, I have a brief history lesson. Uh, back in 07, the Proposition 218 allowed the property owners and our ratepayers to protest the increase Your in sewer on. rates. Is my mic on? Is that better? Mm -hmm. No. I'm going to talk into it. Sorry about that. How's that? Okay. So here's a brief history lesson. In 07, Proposition 18 allowed the property owners and or rate payers to protest the increase in sewer rates. Prop 218. Prop 218. Um, the uh, hundreds and hundreds of people were upset that the increase in sewer rates would take place, but not an increase in sewer connection fees. And so an ad hoc committee was appointed and a year later came back with a recommendation of increasing the rate almost double to $12,000. City Council, and I think SLIRT was on that ad hoc committee. Uh, the City Council in 08 decided that was too high, so they bumped it down below 10 grand. Okay. Now, if you look at the loan documents that we have with the State Revolving Fund, the expansion portion is to help pay the sewer connection fee is to help pay the expansion portion of the wastewater treatment plant. And that's why I've been asking you about where is that Wildan report that says the expansion portion is only 11.8% because many people believe that it's far higher, 50% or better, okay? So I wanna see something like this done to help create more building and I also want to see a program where those funds are used, utilized to pay off the expansion portion on the WWTP. So that's why I was looking for that report. We all received a copy of that report. Yeah, you do have the final copy of the Will Then report. Uh -huh. I don't. Provide you an, an, another copy of the final report. You provided it. I have, We've I, all had it. Yeah, I've provided for the council with a copy. Two years. I'll provide you another copy. Okay, thank you. So, are there uh, council uh, questions, clarifications? Is there public comment on this item? Okay, seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the council. I move to approve resolution 2011-40, uh, establishing a payment plan for the financing of sewer and water capacity charges. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, I would just offer that, uh, again, my, my hat off to uh, the city staff and Mr. Black for this uh, creative uh, incentivizing. And um, I think it's going to uh, be a minimal risk to the city which is the interest, I think, of this dais also. So thank you. So motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you uh, pull the vote, please? Council Member Ania? Yes. Council Member Murray? Yes. Council Member Shalong? Yes. Council Member Westfall? Yes. And Mayor Schlert? Yes. So. Motion carries uh, unanimously, five to nothing. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time we've uh, finished uh, new business and we will uh, move to uh, city council uh, uh, legislative matters. Uh, Mr. Uh, Palazzo, anything on the legislative side? I do have a, the 2011 legislative briefing uh, will be provided by the League of California Cities. It's a webinar. I was going to sign up for that and invite you know, two council members if they would like to attend that uh, with me. It'll be open if Mr. Black and other uh, staff members uh, will also attend. I have a list of updates that they're going to take a look at. Um, the state's budget, redevelopment, um, 
SB 89 VLF sweep, realignment, uh, medical marijuana, uh, several other items, but they'll be discussing uh, updates and all that. Very good. Mr. Black, did you have anything? Uh, nothing to update at this moment. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'll turn it to my colleagues. Uh, Mr. Nia, any reports? I attended the uh, Rotary's Taste of the Holidays last Saturday night, which was done. We had a lot of people there, and that money goes to scholarships for high school ch kids. I attended the bid meeting la last uh, week. And also I, uh, along with Mayor Slurt, attended the webinar for police restructuring. I, I guess that's the title. A, a re realignment. Realignment is the, is the correct word, and that that lasted about an hour and a half. And um, if the public only knew all the realignment stuff that's going through, and you know when you read things in the paper uh, where it said we're going to have maybe six or seven people released back to our county after they serve their time for nonviolent crime and be put on probation or parole here with monitoring devices and our local probation department will will oversee that those six or seven people that are coming were originally from here so they get released here but if I was getting out of state prison in Pelican Bay and I lived in Los Angeles I don't want to go back to LA I'm gonna say my new home is gonna be Crescent City I like it here and so there is there is no set number of the number of people that'll be on parole or probation that'll come to our county. You don't, they're not kept away. You can go wherever you want after you report in to your first probation officer in the county that you live in. Then you can go anywhere in the state. So I think small rural counties are gonna get overwhelmed with probation and parole people because there's less law enforcement here for one reason. And I don't think our probation department's gonna be able to take all the people we're gonna get eventually. And we actually had some uh, follow-up uh, discussion with the chief after the webinar uh, where we talked about the concern is the impact on the city uh, because right now the county is uh, supposedly going to receive something like $235,000 and the city receives not a penny. So I don't know if we can give the chief marching orders to go to the county and, and uh, get whatever he can get because our concern is uh, that in fact that most of the potential problems will probably occur in the municipal part of our region just because that's where you have a critical mass of people and businesses so the concern was uh, the, the chief is already challenged on his budget and if he has additional uh, demands made of him and he's not getting any compensation then that's problematic for all of us hmm. I wonder if it would be a good idea to have a report done on what other cities this size have in terms of a police force we, we have that information it's not much okay. different it's not Some much different laying the, them off the thing that we have here is that our population is small, but we're the only city in the county, so we have a lot of people coming in. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of unique with, with that. And so, um, although people are laying people off, maybe that's the last that they are with their, with their budgets. Ours is 35% for police. Most cities are 50% and more. Mm -hmm. Modesto is 75% of their budget is public safety. I think San Jose is also 75% of our money. And one of the reasons, if I may, Mayor, I, I wanted to make one Please. more point on the realignment. Nonviolent crimes, and we're talking about burglary right now. Person commits 10 burglaries and gets caught. Under the old alignment, you go to state prison. You go to state prison. Under the new alignment that started October 1st, you go to county jail. The judges have already sentenced people to three years in the county jail here. County jail used to be only for one year. Everything else you had to go to prison. Now there's felons being put in the county jail. One was sentenced last week to three years in the county jail. And what's that do? That person has to stay for three years, but they have to release somebody out of the county jail that may have just committed a nonviolent crime, so they serve a few hours or a day. I call it the Lindsay Lohan effect. She was sentenced to 30 days in jail. The other day, she served five hours and 30 minutes. Oh, boy. 
Well, I thought that's, that's because gonna, she. I thought that's because they want to let her out to do her Playboy shoot. No, it's because of the jail in. overcrowding, and that's exactly <laughs> what we have here. So now, that, since last week, there are three people in the county jail sentenced to more than a year in jail, and they have to release three other people. So this, this, so if I was a burglar in this county. And would I live not, here. Would you not give them any ideas? Let me give you this one. If I was a burglar of this county and I committed 10 burglaries and I get sentenced to the county jail here, I'd have visitation three days a week and I'd live in my same county instead of being sent to San Quentin or any other part of the state where people would have to come and visit me long distance. So the incentive is, what do I care? I'm going to stay in my county. That's how the law is now and it's going to be terrible. I, but I, I think that most um, prison inmates go back to their home because it's what they know. Well, Ms. Murray. Let's see. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is that um, I had a request for um, a presentation by Jeff Walsfield um, and the Crescent, Crescent Elk 6th grade. Um, you may recall the letters that we all received, and he would like um, the sixth grade class to do a presentation for us on December 5th. So I wanted to see if the rest of the council would be interested in that. We, we, you recall we've had them do presentations before and they're very informative and it gives um, good recognition for the work that they do. I think that'd be good. Okay, good, everybody. So we'll go ahead and let him know. And thank you again, Jeff, for having, he, I talked to him about those letters and he said um, that it was a real learning process because most of the kids, people don't, send letters anymore so they didn't even know how to do addressing an envelope for example or how to how to write a letter because we all do texting and email so it was a real learning process so again congratulations for um, the work that they all did <clears throat> I too attended um, the taste of the holidays um, sponsored by the Sunrise Rotary and it was a terrific turnout and um, then Friday night I attended the art walk and um, the six degrees of celebration, they had their um, chamber mixer, and she had uh, food by the three top caterers, Wakefields being one of them, and then uh, Julie, uh, fabulous foods by Julie and Vita Cucina, and it was wonderful. And I also got to see um, all the progress that the Lighthouse Repertory Theater has done on the Old Reds Theater, and it is really amazing. So um, they're they're making progress, but of course funding is still an issue. So if if people find that they have um, some money that they don't know what to do with, they're still taking donations. Um, I attended the tri-agency meeting and we um, approved two small business loans. So we have two um, new small businesses that the tri-agency is um, helping. And um, our um, Wesley Chesborough is having, um, he'll be in our county um, on Thursday and they're having an event for him up at the Smith River Rancheria. So if you want to try and talk to him about anything, you could find him there. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Westwall. Uh, yes, I'm very pleased to report that the new pet shop that just recently opened on 3rd Street is doing a booming business. And I want to congratulate them. Um, this weekend, somebody brought to my attention about the charges of Del Norte Ambulance. And I remember a year or two ago, we had them in front of us asking for a 50% increase in their rates. And uh, as I recall, we granted them a 30% increase in their rates. But then uh, it just dawned on me, we never asked for their financials. So I think the next time we discuss that subject, we should be looking at their financials. Ms. Westfall. Yeah. Uh, the city does not have a, or Del Norte Ambulance does not have a contract with the city. They have a contract with the county. Uh, when they came before the city council, they were just asking for us to support their endeavors as they went to the county to ask for an increase in their, in their payout rates. <clears throat> That's correct. Thank you. Thank you for correcting that. And I still think we should look at their financials. Um, I've been uh, investigating uh, countries that are prospering in these hard economic times and one is a country in South America, Venezuela, and what they are doing, their president has been using their pension funds to transform their country. And um, a little over a year ago while I was in court on the, um, the initiative to reduce the sewer rate, uh, I had brought up that we should stop CalPERS defined benefit pension plans and instead have all new hirees go to the defined contribution plans 
the city currently spends in excess of two million on their retirement plans. Well, in this vein, I was wondering if there's anything that we could be doing with pension monies to help people uh, set up jobs, businesses, bring in industries, and things like that. And one other thing, um, where is Bill Renfro? Isn't he supposed to be at these He's meetings? On vacation tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wanted to get a report from him on if they've streamlined the opening business process that we had talked about uh, over the last few years. And he is working on that. And he personally helped the new um, fish market. He personally walked them through that at the county to get them going because he wanted to see for himself what the process is. And he told me he's coming back <laughs> with the way to streamline. Good. Thank so you. isn't it illegal to, as a uh, municipal uh, leader, to take people's pension funds and put it into your uh, general fund to improve your city? Well, we, <clears throat> when we pay for the pensions of city employees, when we make that contribution, it goes to Sacramento, to CalPERS, which is a legislatively established body it has its own board of directors and they um, have some extremely sophisticated advice on where they put their money and uh, they have their down they have down periods but they on the whole are extremely successful at making money um, on their investments and they do they do invest um, they do invest back locally through uh, home loans, uh, but uh, I don't think I don't think they're in the business of business loans. But they do make a lot of home loans at, uh, generally speaking, very good rates. So CalPERS loans are a big deal in this community because they're available to retirees and public employees alike. But I've never heard that they have a, uh, a program for investing in small business. But in any event, it would not be up to the city council. They would they would make those loans through their own process. And they, you know they have to have underwriting and they have to they have to make sure that it's not too high a risk because it's not their money either. Thank you, Bob, for that clarification. Anything else, Ms. Westwell? That's it. Okay, Ms. Schwell. Um, uh, let's see, I attended the Joint City County meeting. Um, Saturday night, I attended the Coast Guard Auxiliary 10 year celebration. Um, this last Thursday, we had our airport meeting. I'm happy to report that we're moving forward with uh, concept designs. Um, and uh, I think there's a meeting in the next month to meet with the um, engineers and, and uh, architects. Uh, this Wednesday, we have our solid waste meeting. Uh, this Friday, uh, we have our Veterans Day parade. Um, and Friday night is our very last Warrior football game in McKinleyville. Happy to report last weekend, both JV and Varsity won against Arcata. JV won 34 to nothing. Um, and um, I wanted to comment on the kids that wrote the letters to us. Um, I'm extremely pleased with those kids. But in, they specifically ask that we as a council look at the um, rules of disallowing tobacco products to be sold near schools. And so I thought if you could do a little research on the new law that they're talking about um, so that we could provide them with information as well, that that would be appreciated. And I can give you a copy of one of the letters because they actually give the information that they're talking about. I'd like to get consensus from the council if you want any work done. That's fine. Do we, do we think we're going to have any if established? It's, if it's a big deal, I'll do it myself. Well, we, can, we can do it for <laughs> the you. Kids, I, I like the kids come here every single year and provide us with so much information and so much support and for us to just sit here and, and accept it and never provide them any feedback, I think, is wrong. We can uh, mm -hmm. do some research. I'd just like to focus Ruby, and then I'll work with the chief to get it done. And then I can consensus with the council on that. It's within 1,000 feet of a school. So directed. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and I'd also like to see um, an updated attorney's report on um, dollars spent on all of the legal cases that we're handling right now. Everything from the recall to the Barnes lawsuit, um, the police department lawsuits, and uh, Westfall lawsuit so that we can have, um, we haven't had an update for a while. So I'd like to see that. I, our attorney's fees this month were um, pretty high. And so I think we need to take a look at that. And um, there is a, the Redwood uh, Mural Society is um, celebrating another mural down the harbor on November 15th. And I think that's it. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have 10 items to go through here. Um, we had uh, a couple of meetings, the city manager and myself with the uh, Crescent City Fire Department and the Crescent uh, Fire Protection District regarding a training officer, the RFP, the interview, and uh, I'm happy to report the selection. Um, and then uh, we had the Elk Valley Rancheria uh, Utilities Ad Hoc Commit Committee uh, meeting that my colleague forgot. Sorry, I was there. <laughs> That's fine, I, just I forgot know. to report. <laughs> And then, uh, as uh, Mr. Ania mentioned, the webinar with uh, Chief Plack uh, regarding the prisoner realignment and the release. Uh, I did an interview with ABC News uh, out of San Francisco regarding the tsunami recovery uh, at the harbor. And uh, they're supposed to be airing that, apparently, at prime time uh, to uh, the four major markets in California uh, for Sweeps Week. Um, I attended a Veterans Monument uh, Committee meeting. Um, had a meeting with the uh, city manager, uh, the CAO, Mr. Ania, and, and some of our city staff regarding the Proposition 84 Parks uh, Grant with the state representative, and that's for the ballparks. Uh, and, and facilities uh, being proposed behind Rays and Safeway. And then there was, uh, as recent as last Friday, uh, an interview with myself and the city manager uh, with NBC3 Eureka regarding um, Crescent City's uh, tsunami landing demolition and the renaissance and recovery of Crescent City. So there's uh, three or four stories that will be forthcoming, supposedly. And then um, uh, I had a meeting with uh, Harbor Commissioner Scott Feller, and uh, he wanted me to report that the harbor will be open and ready for business uh, December 1 for crabbing season start. Uh, that's the good news. They're doing the final dredging over by uh, dock uh, number or letter E. and. Um, uh, so I guess I would like to offer a salute from the city council and the city that um, the harbor commissioner, Mr. Young, and the harbor, or the harbor master, Mr. Young, and the harbor commission um, have all worked hard, plus uh, the contractors and the uh, recovery work crews um, to make some magic and get us uh, basically fully operational for crab season. Uh, that's the good news. The, the not so good news is the early indications are that uh, the crab are, are not very mature and will probably delay the start of the crabbing season. So some good news and some bad news, but mostly good news. So that's uh, what I have. Really quick, I forgot to mention that um, in the report that our city manager gave us this evening, there is the certification of the Crescent City LCP by the Coastal Commission. And um, I don't know if this is just an error, but it says it's addressed to Mr. Taylor. And it says the executive director of the Com Coastal Commission has reviewed the Board of Supervisors resolution instead of the City Council. So I don't know if that needs to be addressed. Mr. Coastal, Commission, the Coastal Commission approved the plan, I believe, on Friday. So everything should be done. That's I'll look at the letter. It's probably an error. I, I don't know. That. Thank you. I'll check that, though. And then one last thing here. Mr. Palazzo uh, gave me a uh, 
notice here that says there's gonna be a first nationwide test of the emergency alert system uh, to take place November 9th, uh, this week at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And uh, the National Emergency Alert System is an alert and warning system established to enable the President of the United States, if needed, to address the American public during emergency. It is an, another critical communication tool that can protect the public and strengthen uh, our nation's uh, resiliency. The National Weather Service governors and the state and local authorities also use part of the system to issue more localized emergency alerts. The test is an important exercise in ensuring that the system is effective and communicating uh, critical information to the public in the event of a real national emergency. So again, that's uh, November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have one additional item. Yes, please. Strategic plan workshop that we need to schedule with the city council. And I was uh, looking at either December 1st, which is a Thursday, second Friday or Saturday the 3rd. And what I'd like to do is bring in a facilitator to work with the council on the big picture mission vision, uh, talk about you know, some of the goals uh, that staff will put together, the strategic plan, uh, but what we need from the city council is th that big picture uh, vision. And I'd like to take three to four hours of your time to put this together. Uh, what's good with my colleagues? The Shalong works during the week. <laughs> Am I the only one that works? <laughs> I thought you said a Saturday. Yeah, we could do Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Uh, if we do it Saturday, which is fine with me, I'd, um, I think it'd be nice if we waited till after we did the ribbon cutting at Frontier, because um, they've requested our presence there. Um, so maybe we do that at 11, and then we could meet and do a lunch workshop. Workshop. We can do a lunch workshop. Good. I'm good with that. For you. That'd be the third? Saturday. December the third. 3rd. Correct. At uh, noon. Noon to four? That would be fine. Um, yeah, it might be noon to five if we, okay. if we get started, but I'd like to, well, I'll keep it moving. Great. And w would that be it? at the wastewater treatment facility? I'm thinking it would be at the wastewater treatment facility. I'd like to set everybody around the table and sure. roll up our sleeves. and. Excellent. Time Look forward to it. Coming? It's 11 o'clock. Okay. So directed. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will adjourn. To the next uh, regularly scheduled meeting, November 21st of 2011 at 5 p.m. Thank, Thank you. you.